Hello again. I've had a request from somebody who wanted me to show an example on how to calculate the area moment of inertia of an I-beam. So I thought that was a pretty good idea, and I'd like to do that now. Um, I've got a cross-section of an I-beam I just made up here. Um, it's 260 millimeters tall. It's 110 millimeters wide. This part here and here, those are called the caps, at least in English. Um, that web right there is 180 millimeters, and the thicknesses of each of those three parts is 40 millimeters. Now, I'm going to show you how to do this two different ways, okay? The first way I'm calling a negative area way, a negative area method, and I've made a little model here. There's what the I-beam looks like. Now, if you can imagine this, this is the rectangle out of which this I-beam might have been cut, okay? All right, so these areas I have checked off here, I'm going to call those negative areas. Now, we already know the area moment of inertia for a rectangle is 1 over 12 times the base times the height cubed. Well, we know the area moment of inertia of the entire shape, and we know the area moment of inertia of those. And it turns out that since these, uh, the centroids of all three of those line up, we can just remove these areas like that and be left with that. That's called a negative area method, and I'll show you that here in a minute. The other way to do this is a little more uh, typical, and that's to divide this I-beam up into three different boxes. And I'm going to show you how to do that, too, and we'll see we get the same answer both ways. All right? Now, there's the equation that describes how we're going to do this is the same no matter which method you use. And it looks like this. I total, I for the entire I-beam, is just the sum of a bunch of terms here. And I'm going to write this out, and then I'm going to tell you what they mean. Okay? Each, I'm going to write out a term, and each term corresponds to a box, either a positive or negative area box. Now, I've got three terms on here because no matter which way I do this, I happen to be using three boxes. If you've got a more complex shape that requires you to use more than three boxes, that's okay. You just start adding more of these on. Let's look at the terms themselves for a second. I1, well, now I'll define which one is number one here, but that's going to be the area moment of inertia of the first box, whichever box that is. This is its area. This right here is important, this D. D is the distance between the centroid of the individual box and the centroid of the entire shape. So let's start by looking at the uh, negative area method. What I'm going to do here, let me erase some stuff. Um, let's see, we know what those, those uh, dimensions are. And I'll get rid of that. Actually clean this up a little bit. Okay, so we've got just the I-beam now. And what I've got with that negative area method, I've got a, uh, let's pretend that's the entire shape now. 110 millimeters wide, 260 millimeters high. Okay. Now, the centroid of those individual boxes matches up with the centroid of the final shape. Since those, we're measuring the centroid about this axis here, about the x-axis, all right, so since those are all the same, have the same altitude, D is zero for all three. Okay. So that goes to zero, that goes to zero, and that goes to zero. The other part about this is I'm going to, see, I'm going to call this, uh, call that one, that two, and that three. Okay. Two and three are negative areas. I'm going to wind up subtracting these. Okay, that's how this works. So let's just go ahead and work through this. I1 is 1 over 12 uh, base times height cubed. And since it's the, outs, the, the overall, I'm going to uh, use capital letters for this. Okay, so it's 1 over 12. Now the base is 110 millimeters. And the height is 260 millimeters. That expression's cubed, and that works out to be, check this here, um, let's see, 1.611 1. uh, 
millimeters to the fourth. Now, that's a huge number, right? 161 million, I guess. Now, the reason that number is so big is we're dealing with millimeters to the fourth, and a millimeter is only about that big. It's this little tiny distance. If we were to do this in meters, we would get 10 to the minus 12 times that, because a meter is about that big, and it's a thousand times different than a millimeter, okay? 10 to the 12, 10 to the 16th, which one is it? Let's see, 10, 12, six, uh, 10 to the 12th difference, okay? Now, the uh, area moments of inertia of boxes 2 and 3 are the same, so I only need to figure out one of them. Equals I3 equals 1 12th base times height cubed. Now, these are these little ones. I'm just going to designate those with a uh, small letter rather than a capital letter. So that's 1 12th. Now, the base there, I believe, is 35 millimeters. You can work that out for yourself if you don't believe me. Times, and that distance right there is 180. And if you work that out, you get uh, 1.701 times 10 to the 7th millimeters to the 4th. Okay? Another real big number, but around uh, 10 times smaller than that one. Now, there's two of these negative areas there, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to say I total, okay, working on this. Now that term and that term are going to be the same, so I'm just going to subtract one of them twice. Okay, equals I1 minus 2 times I2. I2 and I3 are the same, so it doesn't really matter which one I pick. And if you do that, you get 1.271 times 10 to the 8th millimeters to the 4th. That's the area moment of inertia of that I-beam, okay? So we're good to go. We know this is the answer, and I'm going to show you now that if you build the I-beam up out of individual boxes like this, one, two, and three, you're going to get the same answer. And we have to do this a little bit differently. We're adding three positive areas now. That term's going to be positive, and that term's going to be positive. So let me erase my board here, and we'll do this again all that. Remember this number right here. We're going to see that one again. Okay, let's see. Let's see if I can erase that. Yeah. Close enough. Okay, now I'm going to change these. Okay, now I'm going to divide this up into three boxes. There's box number one. I'm going to actually erase that too. Let's put that outside here. That's one, that's two, and that's three. All right. Now, that's still the area, the centroid of the entire shape. It's also the centroid of box 2, so I already know that D2 is going to be 0. Now, D1 and D3 are not 0. If you work, work the numbers out, that works out to 110 millimeters, I think. Let me just double check. Um, yeah, 110 millimeters that direction, and 110 millimeters that direction. Okay, so now we've got that expression, and we're going to go ahead and we're just going to plug in the numbers for that expression. So let's see, we need to know I1, that's 1 12th base times height cubed, that's for up there. So that's 1 over 12 times the base is 110 millimeters. Okay, remember it's 110 millimeters wide. The height is 40 millimeters. Cube that, and that works out to be. Let me see here. I one. Do I believe that? No, oh, I do. Okay, that's five point eight six seven times ten to the five millimeters to the fourth. Okay, that's I one. Turns out that's also I three. Okay, so I2, same thing, 1 12th BH cubed. See how this is getting kind of routine? What I'm trying to show you here is this is a process, and the process is the same no matter what the cross-sectional shape is. That equation never changes. These don't even, you know, these individual terms don't even need to correspond to rectangles. Instead of 1 12th BH cubed, if you had some other shape, you'd use some other expression. But it's still I1, I2, I3. Okay? This is very, very flexible. Any shape you can define as being the sum of other shapes 
you can do this way. Okay, so let's keep going here. That now the base of that is 40 millimeters, and the height is 180. Okay, and that one turns out to be. Let's see. That is I two. That is 1.944 times 10 to the seventh millimeters to the fourth. Okay, next thing we're going to need to know is the area of the two of them, of the, of the two different types of boxes, A1 and A3, are going to be the same. That's just the base times the height. So that's going to be, let's see, 110 millimeters times 40 millimeters, which should be 4,400, if I remember right, squared. Okay, and A2, see how this is, just, we're just doing this over and over and over again. This actually starts looking a lot like a spreadsheet. You can just about calculate this uh, using Excel or some other spreadsheet program if you like. Okay, that's also BH, and so that's going to be 40 millimeters times 180 millimeters. And if I remember right, that's 7,200 millimeters squared. Let me double check here. And yes, that's 7,200 millimeters squared. Last thing we need to know is D. D2 equals zero because the centroid of that box is the same as the, as the centroid of the entire shape. D1 equals D3 equals 110 millimeters. Okay, so we're going to go through this whole calculation now. I1, okay, is equal to the same as I3. I1, right there. I2, right there. I3, right there. A1, right there. A2, uh, yeah, A2, right there. A3, right there. Okay. D1, okay, 110 millimeters. D2, zero, right there. D3, 110 millimeters. We've got all the pieces put together now. So all you've got to do is plug all those numbers into your calculator, or your iPad, or whatever it is you're using to do this calculation, and you find out, okay, if you add all this up, you get 1.271 times 10 to the 8 millimeters to the fourth. Well, son of a gun, we've seen that number before, right? So what we've done now is we've taken this shape, okay, We've calculated the area moment of inertia by adding up the effects of these three boxes, just like I did there. And we've used a negative area method. So we put this thing back together while I'm talking here. Ugh, can't get it. Oh, I got it in upside down, that's why. There we go. There we go. Negative area method. Started with this outer rectangle and subtracted out that area and that area to get an equivalent answer.